Hello everyone, I'm Shimon Yu from Georgia Tech. Today is my great pleasure to be virtually invited to Semicon Taiwan SIP Global Summit. I'd like to share some of our research progress in the field of the monolithic 3D integration of AI accelerators. As you know, the AI systems are becoming prevailing in today's daily life. Here are a few examples like the self-driving car, the language translation on the fly, or the image analysis in the biomedic applications. On the right-hand side, you see many neural network models that are widely used today, including the deep convolutional neural network, or the generative adversary neural network, or this recurrent neural network. So those models are very data intensive because the number of parameters in the model can range from megabyte to even gigabyte. So we have to train those models with iterative training and then use that for the inference. So it's very computational intensive operations. The fast evolving AI applications will motivate the development of the hardware accelerators. So here we show a few representative platforms used today for the machine learning accelerations. And we see the GPU still dominates the training in the cloud. And FPGA is becoming a popular choice for the edge inference with faster prototyping. And also there is a new trend to develop the digital ASIC, for example, TPU, to accelerate the training in the cloud as well as the edge inference. So here we show the energy efficiency for those different platforms. The energy efficiency is represented by the tera operations per second per watt or T ops per watt. So the GPU is about 0.1 T ops per watt, but it can support floating point computation. Thus it's very high accurate, but the ASIC like the TPU can boost the energy efficiency to like 1 to 10 T ops per watt with a fixed point computation. If you want to further increase the energy efficiency, then we would argue this analog approach with the computing memory platform. It can boost the energy efficiency to like 10 to 100 T ops per watt. But here we have to employ the low precision techniques and then we may have the question whether this can achieve the same accuracy as the digital platforms. Let's look at the computing memory in more details. So here the memory array stores the weights of the neural network model. And each cross point can represent either a six transistor SRAM bit cell or one transistor one RAM bit cell. So here the computation happens this way. We can load in the vector in parallel by activating multiple word lines, and then the current from each bit cell will be summed up along the bit lines. At the end of the bit line, we will have the analog to digital converter ADC to quantize the summation of the bit line dot product. So essentially, we can do this computation in parallel. Thus, we can improve the energy efficiency significantly. Then why RAM for computing memory? RAM is resistive random access memory. It's one of the emerging non-volatile memory. And uh, here, if you look at the cell structure, we have two electrodes. In between, we have oxide. Essentially, this is a variable resistor. We can apply voltage to change the resistance from high random state to a low random state or vice versa. Using the RAM for computing memory includes the following benefits compared to the SRAM. It has much smaller cell size, possibly multi-bit per cell, so it can potentially hold most of the weights on the chip. Remember, we need like maybe more than 100 megabytes on chip. So if we can do that, then we can eliminate or reduce off-chip memory access. And also, RAM is a long volatile memory, that means we can power off the chip without losing the data. And the RAM is backend or LAN compatible, so we can potentially stack that into the 3D fashion. And RAM is becoming technologically 
mature with boundary operabilities. We see that TSMC is offering 40 nanometer RAM process, and Intel reported 22 nanometer RAM process, and there are many other vendors of the RAM, for example, Wenbang, Sony, Panasonic, and so on. As proof of concept, my team at Georgia Tech, together with collaborators from Arizona State University, designed and tipped out a RAM based computing memory prototype chip with 90 nanometer Wenbang technology. So this is a photograph of the die, and we use 3-bit flash ADC, and this chip can support 2-bit per cell operation, and we demonstrate the VGG neural network on the CIFAR 20 dataset inference. So this table summarizes the key metrics compared to the prior work, and we achieved significantly improved energy delay product more than 10 to 100 times better than the prior work. Here I'd like to summarize the challenges we faced in this design. The first one is the ADC overhead. The ADC takes too much area and power. If you look at the layout of our chip, the ADC area is significantly larger than the memory array. And also the ADC power take more than 80% of the total chip's power. And the second challenge is RN's low resistance state is pretty low. And this will result in large quantum current. And we have to size up this max at the edge of the array to deliver this kind of current. And the third challenge is the RN's high write voltage. So we have to use this level shifter to convert the voltage domain from the control logic maybe one volt to the RN's programming voltage, maybe three volts. So we like to propose in the next presentation, using the 3D integration, we can overcome many of those challenges presented in this slide. So here comes our proposal. We like to have the monolithic 3D integration to design the RN-based computing memory accelerator. And here is a conceptual cartoon figure for the partition of those two-tier design. So here we want to place the R1 array together with its closest peripheral, for example, the MAX and level shifter on the top tier, for example, 40 nanometer load, because this is a high voltage domain and um, it's very hard to scale those technology because of the high voltage requirements. But for the peripheral logic, for example, the ADCs, the shift add, and the buffers, we can use the logic process to scale down to like 28 nanometer, 16 nanometer, or beyond. Then this can open up the space at the bottom to allow more ADCs. So then we can improve the energy efficiency and throughput even further. And on the right side, we show the cross-sectional view of the monolithic 3D integration. So the basic idea is that we still have the logic transistor front end of the line process as a substrate, but at the top metal, for example, between metal seven and metal eight, we may have the back end of the line transistor to support the peripheral of the R1 array. And here we, we see the R1 is still as a contact layer between two layers. To enable this proposal, we really need to rely on the progress of the monolithic 3D integration. I believe the audience in this symposium is very familiar with this kind of a chart of the advanced packaging, heterogeneous 3D integration. But we really need to push the technology further to the right-hand side of this chart. Because the monolithic 3D integration really require the VR pitch down to like 100 nanometer. So we can reach the VR density about 10 to power seven per millimeter square. And another key requirement is the low temperature processing to be compatible with the back end of line integration. That is less than 400 degrees C. If we can do so, then the monolithic 3D integration of the RM based computing memory accelerator may be feasible. 
Let's review the recent advances in the modernistic 3D fabrication. The first one is a silicon layer transfer from the CA Latin Cool Cube program. So here, this is basically similar as today's SOI wafer processing. So we have two wafers to start with, and after the layer transfer, then we peel off the top layer, and then we can fabricate the top tier silicon transistor on this uh, P-type silicon. And the key technique here is to use a laser alleling to activate the dopant of the top layer's transistor. And uh, with the recent advances, uh, that you can reach like 500 degrees C of the laser alleling of the top tier. And in the IEDM 2018, they have demonstrated 300 millimeter wafer scale of this kind of monolithic 3D fabrication with a reasonable MOS and PMOS electrical parameters. Also from the National Nano Device Laboratory of the Taiwan Semiconductor Research Institute, the top tier polysilicon recrystallization by the laser alleling is also a promising approach. And uh, this group has been making progress in the past few years, from 50 nanometer SOI to 10 nanometer fin fat to 5 nanometer gate all round transistor with very reasonable characteristics in terms of the ion and on off ratio. Another promising approach is to in situ grow the oxide channel for the back end of line transistor. My Collaborator Professor Suman Data from Notre Dame recently demonstrated a tungsten doped indium oxide channel for the back end of line transistor with excellent uh, characteristics as reported in the VOSI 2020. And the IWO transistor may be a good candidate as a driver for the R1 array because it can support high voltage. So the team at Stanford proposed this next 3D architecture in the past few years. And in their vision, they are going to use the covenant tube transistor as a logic in the top tier, and again, R1 as a memory tier on the top. So the covenant tube transistor has been demonstrated by the Skywater a commercial foundry at US at 90 nanometer load on the 200 millimeter wafer scale. And the architectural level benchmark for this kind of architecture has shown like dozens of the energy reduction and speed up for the conventional CPU workloads. Here our team like to have a case study of the modernistic 3D design towards the machine learning workloads. So here is a physical design of a 2.4 megabit R1 computing memory tile. And uh, here this tile include uh, let's say 128 by 128 subarray with all the peripheral circuits, like the ADC, shift and add, and so on. And then 4x4 four four subarray to form one PE and 3x3 three three PE form one tile. So in total, we have 2.4 megabit R1 design. And we utilize the commercial EDA design flow, but with the modifications to support the mixed signal computation and the 3D partition. So here we custom design the analog blocks, including the R1 array and the ADCs. And we're going to use different technology load for the partition. And then we're going to load in the lab file and net file for different technology load to do the physical design. And then we're going to rely on the cadence inverse tool to do the partition and the routing. And finally, we're going to get the layout as shown in the next slide with the 3D partition. So here is the 2D baseline design at 40 nanometer. In this case, all the blocks are on the same substrate, including the R1 array and the MAX ADC level shifter and the digital blocks. And then we are going to do the 3D partition as we proposed earlier. So the R1 and its closest uh, peripheral will stay at 40 nanometer on the top tier, while the ADC and other digital blocks will be placed at the bottom tier. And then we rely on the massive interlayer wires to allow the routing. So here, this is a finished uh, 3D routing 
uh, in terms of the layout. Let's look at the performance power area PPA benchmark between the 2D baseline and the monolithic 3D design. So this table shows the metrics for the evaluation. And we compare the 2D design purely at 40 nanometer versus the 3D design where we use hybrid technology nodes, like the 40 nanometer on the top tier, 28 nanometer down to the bottom tier, or even 16 nanometer down to the bottom tier. And here we look at the footprint, the ADC count, the interlayer wear count, and also the total power and energy efficiency. So the general conclusions are as follows. First of all, because we have enough space on the bottom tier, now we can increase the number of ADCs about eight times. That means the throughput can be increased by eight times as well. But the instant power will increase by two times. As a result, the energy efficiency throughput divided by power will increase by four times. But the chip footprint can be decreased by 50% because of the area folding. And the interlayer metal wear density is estimated to be about uh, 100k per millimeter square. I think this is within the range of the monolithic 3D integration. These metal wires, including all the signal routing and also the clock and power networks. Another concern for the monolithic 3D is always the thermal dissipation. And we have performed the ANSI simulations to generate the thermal map of our accelerator. Unfortunately, because of the parallel computation, the energy efficiency is high, thus the power density is low. So the thermal map here shows that the maximum temperature increase is below 10 degrees Celsius. And we also have done the compact modeling to benchmark the chip temperature as a function of the power density. As long as the power density is low, then the increase of the temperature is moderate. So here in this graph, we summarize the typical power density reported by those accelerators. And as you can see here, most of the accelerators, power density is pretty low in the range of, let's say, uh, 10 to negative 2 watt per millimeter square. This is much lower than commercial GPU, for example, here, the Tesla GPU is about like uh, close to 1 watt per millimeter square. So that's why the GPU, we need the fan to cool down. But for those accelerators, because of no power feature, the temperature may not be a key concern. Of course, there are many remaining challenges for the modernistic 3D integration. I'd like to summarize some of the challenges here. I borrow the slide from the vertical CMOS scene of the SRC DAPA Ascent Center, where Professor Sumandata is a center director and also I'm part of the center. So within our center, we are doing multiple research tasks to solve some of the challenges here. Of course, we say we need the back of land compatible transistor and we're working on the oxide channel based material for the back of land transistor. And also the back of land memory and uh, for example, the RAN, MRAN, ferro electric transistor are all suitable candidates. To enable the massive connections between the tiers, we need the high aspect ratio inter-tier wires, and we're working on the selective ALD to enable that. And also we may need the fine grained thermal management, and we're working on the aluminum nitride, hexagonal boron nitride materials, utilizing their high thermal conductivity. One of the remaining challenges here is that the P-type oxide channel transistor is also very difficult at this moment. All right, I'd like to summarize my presentation. First, AI accelerators are prevailing in the applications from the cloud to the edge. Computing memory saves the intermediate data movement, thus improves the throughput and energy efficiency. Today's RN technology can be tuned to multi-level states, 
possibly by iterative programming. And the offline inference is the most suitable applications where the R1 holds advantages over S1, like the no leakage and non-volatility. This is very important for the edge intelligence. And the R1 based computing memory inference engine, as we show in our prototype, still faces the challenges such as high rate voltage and no on-state resistance, ADC overhead, process variation, intermediate state, state stability, and so on. To overcome some of those challenges, we propose the monolithic 3D integration of the R1 on top of the logic, and we believe this is a viable solution to alleviate the ADC bottleneck, because now we can have more space on the bottom tier to place more ADCs in parallel to do the computation. And this allows the scalability towards advanced technology nodes, because if the R1 or in general the long volatile memory stay with older technology nodes, we can always scale the preferred logic to advanced technology nodes to 7 nanometer, 5 nanometer, even beyond. And the recent advance in the monolithic 3D fabrication, like this laser recrystallization or the oxide channel transistor, make this approach possible. And we have done the PPA analysis of a case study where we integrate 2.4 megabit R1 for the computing memory accelerator. And from our practice, we show the substantial benefits of the magnetic 3D design over the 2D design in terms of the energy efficiency and the footprint. And the hybrid technology node integration is a key because the memory scaling, I believe, generally lag behind the logic scaling. So we want to place the memory tier at the legacy node and then we aggressively scale the logic tier at more advanced node. Finally, the thermal dissipation in the monolithic 3D may not be a concern for the computing memory accelerators because generally they consume very low power density as we estimated in our analysis. With this, I'd like to thank my collaborators in this research, including Professor Sang Kyu Lin from Georgia Tech on the collaboration of the monolithic 3D physics layout design, and Professor Suman Data from University of Notre Dame on the back of line oxide channel transistor, and also Professor Ji Sang Siu from Arizona State University on the R1 prototype tape out. And also I'd like to thank all the students involved in this research. And this research is in part supported by National Science Foundation and SRC Semiconductor Research Corporation programs, including the Jump and Core, and especially the Ascent Center under this program. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email using this address. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you for your attention.